come to third. This, this is my first published <laughs> performance as an experimental musician. <laughs> so I haven't really learned the rhythms and the proper way of saying things. Um, I thought I'd make a start. <laughs> the previous high point in my career as, a, as an experimental musician came on Wednesday when I rubbed two stones together for a total of 12 seconds in a performance on Walden Pond, which I think I may say was enthusiastically applauded <laughs> by an admiring group of experimental <laughs> musicians. <laughs> so this performance today it is really the culmination of, um, of an exciting and bewildering week. Um, I was, when Aaron and Luke sent me the invitation ages ago, nearly a year, months and months ago, to come and be a resident artist in this week at the Coincidence Festival, I felt delighted, honoured, and bewildered. And I think after a week here, or nine days, ten days, I still feel honoured, delighted, and bewildered. I warned at the beginning on the first day that I could well happen, that after the week was up, I would just think, well, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? <laughs> and go off home. Um, but actually, I don't feel that at all. I really feel it was um, a terrific experience. And the, the, my performance tonight, <laughs> my talk tonight, is for me, I think, a way of, partly a way of just collecting my thoughts, but also, and above all, a way of saying a deep and profound thanks to Aaron and Luke and to all the members of the group this week because I really feel that I've enjoyed it enormously and, and I've learned an awful lot. So it's so really a profound, profound thing. The challenge for me in the week, at least as I understood it, was really to try, because I've no background at all in experimental music, the challenge was to try and open questions about the politics of experimental music, and more specifically about the link or possible link between experimental music and anarchist thought. Um, and the comments I want to make are really grouped around a certain number of concepts. When I'm obvious, it's perfectly clear that I still don't understand. But there are a number of concepts that have kind of caught my attention and that seem to me very important. Um, the concept of the score, performance, silence, listening and directionality um, and principally I think score and silence. The first surprise of the week was really the idea of the score 
because just before we began, in the days before we, we arrived here, the various participants sent emails to the whole group um, saying, attaching their score, the score that they were proposing for, for the week's event. No. So I duly got out my headphones, plugged them into the computer, put them on my ears and opened the attachment to find that the score was an invitation to Grace's grandmother's house. <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose I seem to realize um, that, I mean, I now find the idea of score and the rethinking of score really very really exciting. Um, that I've since realized, I think, that what I previously understood as a musical score, in fact, dictates a hierarchical, hierarchical relation between composer and musician and the public. The composer tells the performers what to do, what sounds to make, and the audience are simply the recipients of those sounds. So the rejection of that traditional um, notion of score is clearly an anti-authoritarian move designed to change radically the relation between performance, between composer, performers, and listeners. Um, and that, I suppose the first thing that struck me about that is that there is a striking parallel with what has been happening with the debates in radical anti-capitalist politics. Um, there again, you get the something like the traditional musical score in the idea of a party-centered or Leninist concept of revolution. Uh, there again, you have the composer, the party leadership, um, really telling the militants and party members what to do and with the masses as a more or less passive recipient of these commands. And this has been increasingly questioned um, over the last what, 30 or 40 years, most articulately by the Zapatistas, and by lots of groups, it's just that the, the Zapatistas and are particularly articulate in their, their, their views. Um, the first group of Zapatistas was the originally a small group in the north of Mexico. Um, the group of about six of them who went to Chiapas in the early 1980s. And they went with the traditional Leninist idea that they would show people how to make a revolution. And their great achievement was that they realized that this wouldn't work at all. The people already were very conscious of the need to make some sort of revolution. They were already very conscious that capitalism was a disaster. Uh, so the Zapatistas learned to listen. And that is which breaks drastically the score, the, rev the traditional revolutionary score. You, know? I mean, you break with the authoritarian hierarchical idea of the party leading the way. Um, so they. And they thought, when they talk about their own history, this is when Zapatismo began, and the rose from this. And their whole approach then to politics and political organization is based on this idea of, of, of listening, of um, 
of taking decisions through assemblies, one of their key concepts, one of their key sayings, is preguntando caminamos. We walk by asking. We don't walk by telling. We ask people the way and we walk. Or you can think of that, of course, as um, opening a politics of dialogue rather than monologue. Um, which, and this approach is centered on the notion of dignity. I mean, we listen to people because they're not just objects. We talk, we ask people the way because they are, we recognize their subjectivity. We recognize um, their dignity. And we, yeah, we recognize them as not just being passive, but as being active. And I suppose one of my questions is whether then we can think of dignity as being the center of experimental music. Is that what's happening with the revolution of the score? Is it saying, well, no, we're not going to treat the listeners as just passive objects. They're not just the masses. We're, sorry, the masses. We're going to, we respect their subjectivity, not only we respect their subjectivity, but we recognize that in society as a whole at the moment, subjectivity is threatened. You know, it was a lot of, of discussion of the, of the demise of subjectivity or the weakening of subjectivity. By turning the score upside down, or by turning the revolutionary score upside down, what we're saying is, we're going to treat people as, um, as, as, as having dignity. Um, so in an experimental music uh, performance, was that is the idea that we recognize the dignity of all participants, whether or not they are making sounds. And if that is so, then the there are two other Zapatista sayings that perhaps are relevant. One is, we walk, we do not run, because we are going very far. And we take our time. These are processes that take time. And there are others saying, we walk at the pace of the slowest. And that, you know, because we want everybody to come along with us. You know. And I suspect, I wonder whether that last one we walk, the place of the, place of the slowest, is particularly relevant for experimental music. Because it's, a, it's really a saying, we refuse to be the vanguard. We refuse to develop things in a way that people will not understand. And this is perhaps one danger of experimental music is that it can become, um, without people wanting to, it, it can become a kind of cult activity that people find, find difficult to understand. And it seems that once we see score in this way, then I, it just occurs to me that it's a very rich way of talking about politics or society in general because the score becomes the center of social conflict. You know, one can say that capital or money aims at or is in the process of a constant tightening of the social score, you know, reducing the space for subject subjectivity, reducing the space for going off and doing their own thing. Um, so this can be expressed either through a dictatorship, or it can just be expressed, or is expressed, by the um, increasing penetration of social relations by, by, by money, that increasingly we are subjected to um, this score, I suppose, it's the score of money. If we think of it that way, um, then radicalizing the concept of the score as experimental music does, it really um, points towards 
a very different concept of how we organize so society. In that sense, the score of a pen experimental music is already a walking in the wrong direction, part of a more general walking in the wrong direction, um, a crack in the relations of domination among many other cracks. Um, the expert core of experimental music, as I think actually lots of people have expressed it during this week in different ways, is that we will not obey. You know? The core seems to me to be a kind of rejection of a musical practice that forces us to obey the composer or some sort of hierarchy. Um, although it's even perhaps within this radicalization, we have still have variations, you know, different roles of the concept of the performer, or different concepts of the role of the performer. I mean, and the responsibility of the performer in a concert situation. Um, and again, this is something I mentioned yesterday, I see parallels with, with discussions within the kind of anarchist autonomous movement between, on the one hand, the emphasis on horizontality, which would treat everybody as being the same, and the Zapatista's emphasis, which is slightly different on mandar um, obedeciendo, to rule or to, 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 to exercise authority by obeying. In other words, it's the idea that in a situation in the development of the community, we do have posts of authority, but the people in authority must always obey the members of the community and also that there is a rotation of the posts of, 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 of authority. Um, and I see this, I think, in the slight differences between the um, performers this week that some kind of lean towards a more um, horizontalist conception, others towards a more conception that puts more emphasis on the performer and the responsibility of the, 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 the performer. Obviously, me being here tonight, I'm leaning towards the risk I'm performing. I'm assuming the responsibility of the performer, though um, I hope that um, I can obey at the same, same time. So if you want me to stop, and stop. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, I suppose I'm the, yeah, I, I, there are things I kind of want to spell out because at moments what I felt this week um, is a slight sense of people perhaps not being lost but looking for a direction. Um, you know, that I got the feeling that in the initial phase of experimental music, yeah, after 4.33 um, that there was perhaps a clearer idea possibly of the politics of the music um, now I felt a little bit in the feeling of um, people wanting to, 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 to be clearer about which way they're going um, so I think it, it perhaps if we think of the concept of score as being a concept that is directly political, then it would be good to um, think through the implications of, of that. And then the second group of reflections that I wanted to, to make um, has to do with the question of silence. Um, again, um, kind of shock at the beginning. Well, not exactly a shock. Mm. In a nifty performance, we start by two or three or four minutes of silence, and I'd be wondering, well, what's this? I'm not going to do anything. And, and then they did, and then I got used to it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I, 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 so 
I was now able to see with it at the start of this. But, but um, it, clearly silence is central to, to, to experimental music. Um, and I learned, I think I have learned, I, um, or sort of understand, that silence has many different meanings. Um, the one that draws me first, I suppose, is the idea of silence as a pushing away of the noise of the world. You know? um, that it is a space where you, you remove yourself from the noise of everyday interaction, or quite literally, the noise of the world. Um, a space for letting in different sounds, a space for sensitization. Um, and in that sense, I understand silence as a protest against noise. Um, we live in a society that is increasingly noisy. Um, if you go into a shop, if you go into restaurants, if you go on the streets, it is noise all the time. It is noise that becomes, um, I think, increasingly hard, or for many people, increasingly hard to, um, to live with. Um, and perhaps we should think of that noise as being a silencing. You know, the, noise is a, the noise is a silencing. It's a noise that blocks out other noises. A noise that kills our senses. Um, a noise that doesn't let us hear so many things that are going around, going on around us. Ultimately, perhaps, it is the noise of the train in which we are all sitting. A train that is probably hurtling us towards the annihilation of humanity. So then silence is a move against noise. It is a move against noise. It is a move against silencing. You know? um, so silence is, as I understand it, a listening. A listening for the unheard. But this unheard isn't just an unheard. It's a silence. We don't hear it because it has become unheard, because in some way it has been silenced, it has been filtered out of our hearing. Um, and listening then is a counter-filtering or an anti-filtering, an, an attempt to reach and incorporate in music sounds that are beyond their normal hearing beyond normal audibility. Um, and there, I think, for example, the first, first night of the festival, we had a performance where we listened to Joachim's recording of water and also um, Michael playing on the rice bag. Yeah. And yeah, so it, it's kind of you listen to water because we don't normally hear that water. We don't normally hear the trickle of the river, for example. Um, and I suppose, so silence, as I understand it, is, means listening. Right? We are listening, listening for the unheard, and the unheard is a silence. You know, I mean, with the water, we don't listen, we don't hear the trickle of streams, because we who live in cities actually don't come close to those streams, apart from anything else. You know. And then, if we're listening for the unheard, for that which is silence, then I think that brings in the question of directionality. How do we direct our listening? Um, there is a quote that I 
brought up during the week was really Cherling's performance um, on the first night, yes, second night, second night, that, uh, of um, a film that made me think of a quote um, from a, an article by John Berger in which he says, and I quote, yet it can suddenly, it can, sorry, yet it can happen suddenly, unexpectedly and most frequently in the half night of glimpses that we catch sight of another visible order which intersects with our ours, with intersects with ours and has nothing to do with it. The speed of a cinema film is 25 frames per second. God knows how many frames per second flicker past in our daily perception. But it is as if at the brief moments I'm talking about, suddenly and disconcertingly, we see between frames. We come upon a part of the visible which wasn't destined for us. Perhaps it was destined for night birds, reindeer, ferrets, eels, quails. And that seems to be fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. You know, a way, I suppose, that helps me to understand um, perhaps that experimental music, that there shouldn't be a clear directionality because we're actually trying to be open to what is, um, is present between frames of visibility. We're trying to actually be open to. Um, hearing sounds that we are not even aware that they exist. Um, so that certainly points us away from directionality or any sort of targeted directionality. Um, and, um, Manfred was explaining to me the other day about how the notion of deep listening is particularly um, connected, at least for some people, with a kind of targeted, focused directionality. The Berger quote would suggest, no, that we actually need to listen um, more, more, more widely, that our listening should not be too directional. Um, and yet, it seems to me, we deceive ourselves because, um, again, Manfred, I think, was proposing a non-directional um, listening in opposition to them. I think we perhaps de deceive ourselves if we think that there can be a non-directional listening because the listening is inevitably socially shaped. You know? What we hear, what we see um, is shaped by our society, our moment in society, our position in society. So the silence that we're trying to, the silence that that imposes our enemy, is a socially silenced, um, the silencing is our enemy, the silence is, is what we're trying to read. It's a socially shaped si silence, it's a filtered out silence. Um, and perhaps we should be aware of that social conditioning of the unheard and of how we want to shape it. So that I was struck, for example, lots of people talked about how they had done or were doing environmental recording. We had Joachim's water um, in, in the front of the stream. We had um, talk about wind. Um, and I kind of want to say, well, yes, of course, all, all that is social. And that is clear that the composition that Michael made on the basis of Joachim's recordings is, is in fact about not only the purity of the stream, but the danger to streams. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, yes, it is political. But perhaps it is a fairly gentle politics that does not actually keep up with 
the radicality, it's the point of departure. Um, so that if we listen for the sounds filtered out in this moment, in this moment, Michael had this um, example or impressive thing about the difference between the sensitivity of the ear and the sensitivity of the eye. Uh, that we, our ear is capable <coughs> of hearing things at an extraordinary distance. And so I think if we listen in this moment for the sounds that don't reach us, um, then what is it that we're hearing? What is it that has been filtered out? What is it that we can filter in? And clearly one thing is, yes, the sound of the river, or <coughs> the sound of the wind and the trees. But another thing, perhaps, that we should be able to hear if we strain our hearing, would be the cries of child refugees being drowned, possibly at this very moment, in the Mediterranean. Um, or the weeping of people as their houses are repossessed across the United States. Well, it's a million or a few years ago, it was a million repossessions per year in the United States. Or the young cries of protest against the destruction of the world. So, <coughs> why is it that in this hearing, in, we are listening to one type of sound, but that the other type of sound is not so present. That, that's really my question and my, um, my hesitation. Why is it that the sound that was in the performance on, on um, Saturday or Friday, Friday, um, was the sound of the river? Why was it not the sound of people drowning in the Mediterranean, for example. What does that say? What does that say about our music? What does it say about what, how we understand this unheard? If the unheard is a silence, then it is a socially silent. <coughs> if it is a socially silent, then the danger, of course, is that we become complicit in this silencing. We do not want to listen to the train that is carrying us towards our destruction. Or should we think about how we can express that sort of thing through our music? And I'm not suggesting that music should be politically didactical, not at all. Uh, but that we should be aware of the way in which what we filter in and filter out is socially conditioned and that we are an active part of that filtering or at some level, in some way, I suppose I'm saying the music should express a scream against the destruction of humanity. This, this is, I suppose, the dilemma I face in my future career as a, an experimental musician is how to express that. To, um, and, and, and yeah, coming back to my feelings at the end of the week, I suppose I feel that there is a slight tension there, a slight contradiction. Contradiction is too strong, tension between a really radical rethinking of the idea of score. But we at least sense, no, we want a society that is shaped from the bottom up. We don't want a hierarchical society. We don't want to follow the rules. We want to create something new. You know, we want freedom for our creation. But um, to pose that radical demand, I suppose, um, 
I think, for me, suggests that there should be an equal, an equally radical rethinking of the concept of silence and listening. Um, and there, I, yeah, I, I suppose I, I think perhaps there is a less, less radical or less politically explicit rethinking of the theme of silence, listening, directionality. Mm -hmm. And I say this very hesitantly. Um, I say this to us, it was Manfred who said that I don't provoke, I don't want to provoke. Well, of course I don't want to provoke, I don't provoke. Uh, I'm saying it's hesitantly, I'm saying it a bit provocatively. Um, I'm saying it hesitantly because I'm very aware, even at the end of this week, that I really don't understand much of what's going on. And that one of the joys has been to hear a performance, not of the faintest idea of what's happening, and then talk to the performer afterwards, or talk to other people afterwards. Um, and what I find then is that there's a world of understanding and, and the world of sensitivity that is being opened for me which has been really part of the wonderful experience of this week. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you very much indeed. of the art gallery lends the perception uh, and the emphasis on the things that are mundane and how there is this hierarchy of meaning. Um, yeah, and sort of like, it seems to me that pieces like that and pieces like you're talking about are more interested in perception, um, in our perception of things as opposed to really changing things, and the idea of changing things through our perception. Yeah. Um, that is my, yeah. I'm curious um, if you understand. Um, on, on the question of the instrument, I haven't really thought about it, is the, is the answer. Um, but yes, I suppose I have been very, struck by um, 
not a layer of this wonderful instrument there, but also the rice and the paper and the coin. Um, and yesterday, I was very proud of myself to think it was performing my performance number six, um, where everybody we decided we'd have to uh, make music all together. I started um, writing on my page as my way of making music. And I thought, yes, that's my instrument. So, um, yeah, I haven't really thought about it further than that. So, um, yes, I think the question of the art gallery and <coughs> perception. Um, I think that's very, very, it seems to me very central to what um, we've been doing during, during the week or what I've been trying to understand during the week. It's actually breaking down that um, idea of the distance, I suppose, in the, in the art gallery poses a distance between the thing perceived and the perceiver, mm -hmm. and the perceivers kind of reduced to a passive role, and the thing is is um, put there as a thing and not as the result of a process of creation. Mm -hmm. What we've had during the week is Morgan's um, score <laughs> with a piece of embroidery that um, she is that is exhibited or um, present in various galleries or, mm -hmm. um, where people are actively involved and where the idea is very much on the experience of creating rather than this um, objective relation between being produced and passive perceiver. And then perhaps the hope is that the audience goes into their world with a more active perception. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. I yeah. think that would be the goal. I suppose that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, you mentioned um, searching for unheard sounds that we didn't know were there. And you also mentioned um, 433. And sort of in that piece, <clears throat> you know, John Cage is presenting silence as having its own intrinsic value. But in that piece, there's still a score, and there's still instructions to the performer. I mean, the instruction to do nothing is still an instruction. And I was wondering how you think that piece fits in the sort of composer-performer hierarchy, or does it fit at all, or perhaps he's pointing us in a way to look past it. Um, so I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I think it, I have understood it really just from what people have been saying the last week. Um, in the second sense, really, is, yes, I mean, clearly if you tell a pianist, you know, sit still for 4, 30, four minutes, 33 seconds, then that is a clear imposition. Uh, where the composer is determining what he's going to do. But at the same time, I suppose it's opening up. It, it, what's new there, I imagine, is really open, opening up the silence and giving a new meaning to silence. Um, and giving a new meaning to what the audience who are there because they want to listen to a piece, what they start to hear. So the, the Although, of course, clearly it's a, it's a, a clearly defined score. It point, points the way beyond that. You, know? you can buy the Urtex score, but actually there's a, there's a critical edition of 433, <laughs> believe it or not. It's true. It's like it has his sketches on it and uh, the drafts of 433. Questions or other questions? 
this is not a question. I really don't even think it's a comment, but I would want you to know that your comment uh, during your remarks about, and then forgive me if I'm not understanding, but sounds, and you mentioned the sounds of someone in the Mediterranean, that observation, that comment of yours will stay with me. It would be interesting <coughs> to think perhaps about the sounds that would characterize maybe the last year or the last ten years. What are if one thinks of a world of sounds, you know, perhaps to think of well, what sounds would um, tell us most or tell us about changes taking place um, in that period. I mean, in the last few days or last couple of weeks, there have been quite a few articles kind of reflecting back on changes during the decade. And, um, if you thought that about that in terms of some, I mean, two things that strike me are certainly the the rapid, huge rise in the number of refugees and migrants. And, and the fact that now every year, I think it is just perfectly normal that between one and two thousand are drowned in the Mediterranean trying to get to Europe. You know, which is something absolutely unimaginable, I think, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, the same, of course, with um, Mexicans dying in the desert of Arizona, or, or the cries of the children separated from their parents in the, in the camps on the border. Or you could think of the sound of one characteristic of the last 10 years as well has been the huge number of house repossessions. How would you capture that in sound, or how would you capture that musically if, if, if one wanted to? Um, and these are things that become silenced because we get used to them. We forget to go. sounds of what are essentially people suffering, or perhaps the environment suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, I absolutely agree with you that they need to be heard. Sometimes I wonder, though, if the risk of putting something like that in an artwork mm -hmm. isn't kind of twofold. One is that you beautify it. <laughs> and um, kind of anesthetize your response to that sound. And the other, that of course I think we experience. Um, and the other, it's maybe not as dangerous, but it's in its own way kind of odious, is when that suffering of others is used for the benefit of the artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And so it makes it makes that particular question not, it's definitely, I feel, also absolutely worth asking. But it's not a simple artistic problem. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that, that, that's very right. I mean, I think Yeah, I mean, I don't see, I suppose I don't see any easy answer at all. I'm just saying that I think um, that if we think of this listening for the unheard, um, then there is a real question about how we understand the unheard as being a socially silenced. And then, yes, there is another question really about how we express it how we would express it 
in a non-didactical way that just becomes boring, in a way that is not didactical and boring, um, in a way that doesn't beautify it, in a way that doesn't just become a source of profit. I mean, I agree with, with all those, but the problem remains. I found what you said about um, score and performance very interesting. And I, I wonder if uh, one of the things that I find constricting about the social situation of performance in you know, non-experimental non music, if such a thing exists, mm -hmm. is that there are strict success criteria. And uh, the shift toward openness in the experimental mode is a widening of the success criteria in a certain way. Whereas what you're pointing toward with uh, implicit silencing, failure of representation, these kinds of things, are um, problems with failure, right? Uh, they're, they're not, it's not a question of you know, what counts as a success, but mm, does this fail gracefully? What are the consequences of failure in this new mode? And I, I wonder if this is something that's under-examined or implicit in, in your comments. You know, what, what's the sort of negative space of uh, the expanded success criteria that we've embraced? How do you mean failure? Okay. Well, so if, if, uh, if we're no longer looking at the quality of a performance as a marker of its success, mm -hmm. but instead whether it has some kind of reflective effect on our understanding of social circumstances or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, we're no longer thinking about success in the same way. We're thinking about a space of, of ways that thought could sort of collapse in on itself or not mm -hmm. as a result of an experience. And this is like, a, it strikes me as a very different way of conceptualizing what counts as a success for a piece. Yeah. I think that's been one of, not exactly in those terms, but it's really been one of my questions during the week as well. Um, yes, I mean, I can see if you play it traditionally, a piece by Beethoven, uh, you can say, well, that was either a good performance or perhaps not, you know, you've got some notes wrong. Or if you go to experimental music, then what I've been, <coughs> I was trying to get at is really the question then what are our criteria not for success or failure but I think criteria of critique mm -hmm. um, criteria for saying well I don't think you're going in the right direction or criteria for saying yes I think I understand what you wanted to do but I feel you could have done it more effectively in a slightly different way. Um, and I suppose that's part of what you're saying, that once you move from the old store, then you move into a world of uncertainty. Um, and, yeah, and my feeling, I think, among the other experimental musicians of the week is that this feeling that yeah, perhaps we should be thinking more critically about um, about these issues. Um, perhaps along similar lines, in considering the accessible political substance of experimental music or music as a whole. Um, do you see any particular political responsibility on, this, on the part of experimental musicians? I think everybody has a particular political responsibility. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're actually in a fairly critical situation. Um, you know, even if you're optimistic and say, well, maybe we'll avoid total annihilation, there are still many reasons for thinking that we're in a, a situation not very difficult. 
different from the 1930s. I mean, there are lots of, of indications that we're going towards more authoritarian political systems, um, that we're going towards um, uh, increased competition, increased instability, increased fragility, and the, the increased militarization everywhere. Um, a push toward uh, yeah, the possibility, real possibilities of major wars. Um, over and above the actuality of existing um, And in that situation, I suppose in that situation, yeah, we all have a political responsibility I think, to think, well, how do we break with that? But um, Yeah, I suppose my concern is not only how do we break with it, but it's also how do we break the kind of nine to five thing, you know, the nine to five I work well as an employee, construct capitalism, um, do my experimental music, whatever, and outside that I'm an active and an anti-capitalist activist. And I want to say, no, somehow we have to bring our politics home to our experimental music or whatever it is we're doing. You know? And I think one of the first day, really prompted by Aaron and Luke, I raised the question of the connection between um, experimental music and anarchism. Then part of the response was, well, Lots of experimental musics, musicians have been or consider themselves to be anarchists. But I want to go further than that and say, well, okay, if that's true, how does that actually relate to the music? How does, how does that express itself in the music? Or is there any way in which, and I suppose one way in for me has been the concept of score which seems to me, yes, that the score, concept of score and experimental music is clearly an anti-authoritarian one. No. Um, the other way I'd like to go into it is through the question of silence and listening. And there I'm kind of don't, I, I, yeah, I suppose I don't have any clear answers. No. Um, two things, first off. Um, is amazing to have you here and watch your career in experimental music grow. <laughs> now, now, with all these suggestions, you jump right from performance into composition, and I cannot wait to hear your first piece. It sounds, it sounds great. Um, um, that aside, um, I love how you were talking about um, the idea of listening in, as a listening for as something that isn't just a passive hearing that is listening towards something. It has, I think you use the term of directionality to it. And, um, and I think your critique about the listening for the things that are silent, it's very, it's uh, right on the nose It's something that Michael brought up that a lot of us have thought about and I don't know, I don't. Uh, if I did, I would let you. I would use this time to let you know, but I don't. Um, but I think that there are other things that we're listening for, and one of them is um, the idea of things that haven't yet begun to sound. And I think that that is you know, one of the reasons why Luke and I really do see a connection between our music, these ideas of anarchy, and your work, because in, in a lot of your work, you talked about the idea of hope and this kind of radical thing that we don't know what it is going to be, and this thing that might be and that we have to allow ourselves to be open to it. And Luke and I really think that this kind of music and these situations and the politics and the relationship and the social situations that we're able to craft through these scores and these different kind of hierarchies are a way and a way to kind of think about and configure ourselves in ways that are listening to something that might not be there yet, or something that we don't know is going to be. Yeah. So it's a hopeful listening for. Yeah. No, that, that sounds very good. I mean, there's... <laughs> 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 yeah, no, so 
with that since you're listening to the not yet. Yeah. No, I mean, Bloch's terms, Bloch, um, Ernst Bloch in his Principle of Hope talks about really understanding the existing world in terms of the world that does not yet exist. You know, in other words, in terms of anticipations of a different world that exists in our dreams, in our fairy tales, in our art, in our music, in our political practice. You know? So if you say, well, you're, you're listening for sounds that might not yet exist, then that's precisely it. You're trying to listen to a world that does not yet exist. Um, yeah, and that seems to me right, right on. I guess I'm just wondering what the connection is between this listening to people's homes being repossessed and children drowning in the Mediterranean and hope. And what doesn't yet exist. That's all. I'm just... Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, <coughs> that's why I put in my my third. Ex I gave three examples actually: the the children dying in the Mediterranean, the uh, tears of the people whose houses are being repossessed, and the cries of protest of the young. Um, yeah, I certainly don't want to. I mean, in a way, it's more more, more striking for us, but I wouldn't want to just get into listening to misery and damnation. No, the point is actually to listen to to to, to hope, I think. Um, so in that, that I agree with you. Um, if I don't know if I had a point to agree with necessarily. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more just um, I, I think like hope in some ways stems from the misery, you know, or is required mm -hmm. by it. So I'm, I'm more just looking for the connection, rather than, I didn't have a point, really. <laughs> it's basically that, yeah. I didn't have a point to make, yeah. Um, I think that they're connected somehow. Yeah, I think they're, 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 they're clearly connected. But I think perhaps I would say really along what what Aaron was suggesting is that perhaps what we are listening for is the not yet, and whatever way that pre presents itself, no, not yet something, the, that which overflows, that which doesn't fit in. Mm. You know, I think that, yeah. Well, kind of going off of this as well, like, when I think of silence, I think of like that which has been silenced for so long and so almost in acknowledging it and not leaving it in a silence creates a path. I wouldn't even say it's like on the same plane as hope. I'd almost say like, you know, there's steps, there's steps to change and first we need to know, we need to acknowledge what's even happening so that we can then listen for what is, like there's different stages of it almost. Um, because it, silence both gives us the path to and has taken us away from, you know, because when something, like, oh, that's what we were talking about, like noise. Noise takes the noise of, of this, silences yeah. the realities that we're not listening to. And I, that kind of like goes right into the question that I had, which is like, what do you do when they still don't hear it? Like, I was recently in a, a sound healing thing in a, in a cathedral. And at one point, the noises were just so heavy that they felt like helicopters. Like that's just, and even though it was beautiful instruments, it just, it felt like war all of a sudden. And it was like, whoa, I don't think anyone else, like do, do other people feel like, well, I can't say what other people feel like. But like, it just was like, how do people not hear the war in this, you know? Um, and so like as a, as a person that 
as a creator of these of sounds that are meant to make people feel these different ways, like what do you do when they still don't hear it? Do you wait until they do? Do you try words? Um, and then how do you navigate the space between sound and words? There's a lot of questions. <laughs> and I don't know the answers. Um, And also, you never know who hears. Um, there was some. Yeah, I think that's right. You don't. You don't know here who, who, who hears. You don't know what responses um, are going to come up. You don't know what responses are going to come up um, from where. There is some. Again, going back to the Zapatistas, um, a quote from uh, something that Subcomandante Marcos said when he was, when he still had that name, was about, um, I think they felt when they first rose up on the 1st of January 1994, that they were, it was kind of like sending out um, a radio broadcast, and they just didn't know at all who was listening or who was here. Um, or I suppose also um, thinking of Aaron and Luke's invitation to be, I mean, obviously, when I wrote um, Change the World or whatever, I had no idea that this would be heard by experimental musicians. <laughs> Sing or play what you need to say or sing or play. I, wha what you say, I, it reminds me of Walter Benjamin. When you say, because in a certain way he, he writes sometimes about what could be rememoration uh, in contrast to, let's say, knowledge over history. In a certain way, that rememoration of the past can, in a certain way, maintain history open in the, sen in, in the sense that maybe uh, something that we suffer can be concluded and at the same time, or can be, in a certain way, healed, or that um, at the same time, being open for uh, for hope, for uh, uh, resolution, and so I think uh, it resounds very much what you asked or what you what you mentioned. So the idea of I say not knowledge of history to learn from it, but uh, we must know something about what happened. And this is what you proposed, it. Yeah. and so uh, how can we deal with history? Like we can rememorize just as an act of changing history, uh, because history is open. We can make history. What was his name? Walter Benjamin, German philosopher. And there's there's some beautiful quotes about rememoration, rememoration in the. In the Arcades Project, which is a huge book, but you can find there some, some. I think all of his work deals with rememoration. Maybe a couple more questions, and then we can. That sound. Except, and then we can partake in some wine and ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're interested in reading, any of them. This huge project. But the, the, the best thing perhaps to read is something that's only about five or six pages long. Yes. Which <laughs> <laughs> I'm a student, it's a lot. <laughs> which is his thesis on the philosophy of history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right, yeah. that's very good. And which is just. Hmm? 
Yes, I, I, I quoted from actually this work in my performance. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> at one point you said you have a very far way to go and you might as well walk instead of run. And I, I mean, I've noticed that I feel like a lot of people uh, run, are constantly running towards something. And that's tough on me because when you can finally just be present and walk, um, you'll get there eventually and you just keep walking. Um, but my question was, what if we all walked? And is it possible to, for us all to walk? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. If we all walked instead of running? Yeah. Because some people walk, but not everybody. I, so I'm saying everyone. It's in all yeah. the society. No, yeah. Some people prefer cars. All of you start a problem. I meant walk more as a yeah, not, exactly. not as a form of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're being pushed more and more to run and run and run. Um, you know, I mean, the dynamic of, of, of capital is faster, faster, faster. Um, we all say no, no, slower. Slower, slower, or no, I don't want to run, I want to walk, then um, great persistent collapses. Do we have a final question or not? It's also good. <laughs> For something or, which has been very present the whole week, I think. Um, uh, and looking for it's kind of that combined with the not fitting in, not wanting to fit in, which really I think, as far as I've understood, is is very present in in the stories of all of you. So there you are. Mm -hmm. That's my clue. <laughs> Thank you.